This is Closer to the Fire from the Voice of the Martyrs Canada with a focus on the persecuted church around the world. I'm Greg Musselman. A religious freedom advocate warns that a proposed Canadian law could imperil freedom of speech and religious liberty and that Christians in Canada need to be very concerned. Could quoting the Bible land you in prison? Jeff King is the president of International Christian Concern. That's a religious watchdog based in the United States and says the proposed law, Bill C-367, would amend the criminal code in Canada. Now, in just a moment, I'm going to bring in Floyd Babel. He is the chief executive officer of the Voice of the Martyrs Canada. And we're going to discuss how this proposed law could affect Christians in Canada and freedom of speech. But first, Jeff King told CBN News the proposed amendments to the criminal code would take away some religious exemptions. And basically it creates hate speech laws. Some of those have already advanced in Canada, but Christians were protected. They said, well, if they're saying biblical things or if they're saying things according to their faith, whether that's Quranic or biblical or whatever, they're protected. And this is the alarming thing is that this strips those out. There is no protection. Uh, And as always, this is this is what the dictators and the despots do overseas to strangle Christianity or whatever faith. You know, they say, oh, we have religious freedom, but not in the public sphere. So it's the same game. It's the same game being advanced uh, around the Western world. That's Jeff King of International Christian Concern. Now, the hate speech laws in Canada were passed in 2003 and 2004. Christians and other groups could still have freedom of speech. But 20 years later, those protections could be removed and limit freedom of speech in the public domain, for example, on issues of sexuality. Those amendments would not only affect Christians, but other religious groups who want to express their freedom of speech, whether it's good or bad. Well, joining me to talk about this is Floyd Brabell, as mentioned. Floyd is the CEO of the Voice of the Martyrs Canada, and also a member of the Religious Liberty Partnership, which is a collaboration effort of Christian organizations from every continent focused on religious liberty for all. Floyd, welcome back to Closer to the Fire. It's been a while, Greg. Good to be with you. Yeah, it's good to have you back. And, uh, you know, normally we're talking about issues of persecution. And again, where we are in terms of, you know, persecution in Canada, we're going to get into that a little bit more because you've written a great book called Trouble on the Way, where you talk about the persecution scale. But uh, before we do that, and again, our work is mostly international, where Christians are being persecuted around the world. But uh, when you hear this Bill C-367, do you have some big concerns about it? Yeah, Greg, I think every Christian in Canada should be concerned when they see government passing bills uh, of this nature. Um, You know, freedom of religion or belief has been a staple in Canada. It's something that we've we've (laughs) we've accepted as part of what it what it means to live in a free country. And here we are. I mean, we're a, we're an organization and we're part of the Religious Liberty Partnership where we have the opportunity to speak on behalf of millions of other people that are, are facing uh, restrictions of, uh, of belief, uh, of religion in their countries. And so it's, it's a bit of an eye opener when you see some of these things start reaching our country here. So I think we need to be aware. We need to know. Uh, what what are the aims of these bills? What are they trying to accomplish? Often you see that that some of these bills are actually trying to accomplish some good things, but but they word it in a way that leaves it open ended for you know other things to come in, like the hate speech. Right? We would all agree that uh, yeah, yeah. promoting hatred towards a group or to a people group or online bullying, those type of things. Hey, that that's not morally correct. Those things need to be addressed, right? But uh, when you leave a, a hate speech bill open-ended, then anybody could come in if they have a, a disagreement. And we know, for example, that people for a long time in Canada have been looking at the Bible and considering that hate literature because of its its views on homosexuality or, or other things that uh, that they uh, disagree with in their lifestyle. So I think I think we need it's a bit of an eye opener. We need to be alert and I think we need to be engaged, engage our politicians, ask them what's happening on, look at organizations in Canada that are are tackling and studying these issues like Evangelical Fellowship of Canada or Christian Legal Fellowship and and uh, 
and really get uh, educated on on uh, what's happening with these bills. I know Jeff King says that, uh, you know, as he's trying to raise the alarm for us in Canada coming from the United States, he says, yeah, there's some Christians in Canada, leaders in, you know, in our country that are concerned. But he said most Christians are saying, no, no, it's don't worry about it. It's going to be OK. Hmm. Now, I know that we could be overly concerned. I, I mean, if that's possible, I guess, or not paying attention at all. So trying to find that fine line here, Floyd, I think it is a bit of a challenge. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, we're not an advocacy organization. Voice on Martyrs isn't an adv advocacy organization. However, at the same time, we are citizens of this country. Mm -hmm. And as citizens in Canada, we have a legal voice to step up and to make our concerns heard. And I think that uh, Canadians in Canada, while we still have that opportunity, we should respectfully speak up and say, these issues concern us. Um, we're raising awareness to these issues, right? What what you're proposing really challenges um, Article 18 of the Human Rights Declaration, right? That everybody is free to choose their religion or belief, and to and to um, worship, and to and to share their religious belief, live it out in the in the public square, right? So these are things that are protected. These are things that we've agreed to as a nation. So when you see bills like this coming in that threaten that, um, I think we have the right to raise our voice and go, hey, this is not a value in Canada. What's happening here? And so, um, but I, I I don't want to be, we, we shouldn't be alarmed either because we know if we read the Bible that these things are going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to be prepared. So yes, we can raise our voice, uh, but we need to be prepared to keep 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 going and, and doing what we're called to do as a church, regardless of these things that, that happen. Yeah, I think it's good. And we do have to have that imbalance, uh, you know, remembering again that uh, we take our, uh, you know, orders in a sense from the Lord, uh, you right. know, is revealed through his scripture and uh, we are to love our enemies. And we know that Jesus taught that very clearly, but when society does start to turn against the Bible because of, especially when it comes to the teachings on sexuality and marriage and uh, the gender issues that are going on. Again, we don't want to get caught, uh, you know, just talking about that all the time. Our work is with the persecuted church. That is our focus. And, you know, sometimes people want us to take a more of a stand on certain things. And we say, you know what, as, as a Canadian citizen, a Christian living in Canada, I'm concerned about those, but as an organization, voice of right. the martyrs, our work is again bringing attention to persecution around the world, helping our brothers and sisters, being you know the voice for those that don't have a voice. So that that's important. Yeah. Um, do you, when when you're talking to Christians in Canada, I'm you know around as well. A lot of churches and people are really concerned. They're saying, "Well, the Bible does teach, uh, you know, again, you know that marriage is a man and a woman." As an example, and again, sure. we love all people. Um, that's the message that Jesus told us to give. We don't compromise on that. And I know churches that are struggling. How do we reach a com you know community uh, that may be opposed to what we're teaching? So how do we how do we find that balance then, Floyd? Uh, you know, I guess first individually is Floyd Robel, the Canadian citizen, and then Floyd Robel, the CEO of the Voice of the Martyrs Canada. Yeah. Good question. Well, first of all, I think. I think it's it's finding organizations in Canada that are speaking to these issues. That's what they do. We mentioned Evangelical Fellowship of Canada. We mentioned Christian Legal Fellowship. Um, just a number of good organizations that are are able to um, able to do some real strong research into these bills that are being passed. Um, able to. Um, um, challenge legally some of these things that are happening and able to defend those things. And I think then uh, as Christians, we should throw our support behind these groups, right? If that's a concern of ours, uh, then we need to be able to support these groups and, and their efforts to, um, you know, try to curtail some of these bills that are trying to be passed, right? And and put an end to them. And in the past, they've done an excellent job at at doing that type of thing. And so we need to continue to be able to support them to do that. But as an individual, yeah. too, um, yeah, so there's that support. And then leading Voice of the Martyrs, you know, Voice of the Martyrs, um, people think that 
uh, because there's issues in Canada that we need to right away champion those issues in Canada. Um, and I think that our position is that uh, we are an organization, as you mentioned, that we work with Christians that have no other recourse, right? They don't have a legal recourse in their country. It's very difficult for them to get any legal assistance. Uh, there's not much advocacy of anything happening in their country, and, and there's no, no real means of getting support, uh, providing them with the tools that they need to do the work of the church, right? So that's what we're about. That's what we're for. Uh, we do have, of course, a domestic ministry component that seeks to raise awareness in Canada, uh, but not only raise awareness of the issues of, of uh, religious freedom restrictions in countries like China or in Iran or Saudi Arabia or in, you know, a number of the, the other 60 countries that we work in, uh, but uh, to educate them and, and to um, say, hey, these are the testimonies of of Christians that uh, are are willing to pay a price. So the countries where we work in, right? They love their countries. You know, they love nothing more than to be able to worship freely in their countries, but they can't. Um, and so when we see these things, um, we need to see how they are handling these examples, right? So, you know, as you taught as well, Greg, there, there are different ways to handling persecution, right? There's, there's the ways that you fight uh, persecution, and I think in Canada we we are in a in a position where we can we can do some fighting respectfully, right? We can when when we say fighting, we can say that hey, as Christians, we still have rights in these countries, we still have laws that protect us, and we should utilize those things uh, to our advantage to you know to to be able to fight against those things that seek to challenge our freedom of religion or belief and expression in this country, right? There's the opportunity uh, to flee. Um, and I think when we talk about fleeing, we again talk about uh, those that have chosen to leave their country um, for other countries, but they bring the faith with them and they, they seek to then live as Christians in another culture, in another country, and, and to do the work of the church in those countries, but not everybody has the option to flee. And so then there's the fortitude aspect, right? Where they, right, they need to, um, they need, they need help. Right. And so, um, we're able to come alongside then those that are remaining and say, you know, here's, here's the tools that you're asking for, uh, to do the work of the church in your country. So for us, then what we see is that we have Christians in these countries that are willing to pay a price for the gospel. So when governments fail us, when governments and laws fail, because we've seen all through history that they do fail. Yes. We see that with our founder, Reverend Richard Wormbrandt, right, who spent 14 years in prison, his wife, Sabina, in a concentration camp because of their Christian faith. They, they did so, I, I would say, joyfully. Mm-hmm. They didn't like what was happening to them. They didn't like being separated from each other. They didn't like being separated from their son. But they recognized something deeper going on, that they were suffering for righteousness sake. They were suffering for Christ. They were suffering for bringing the gospel into their nation. Uh, and they wouldn't bow down to the ideologies of that day. And so when they came in and said, having a Bible is illegal, or preaching in the public square is illegal, where evangelism is illegal, what they said and what they saw was that may be that may be considered illegal, but we must continue to do the work of the church, and we will pay the price for having to do the work of the church and bring glory to God. And and so I think here we are in Canada, we're in a bit of a, um, a transition period, if mm -hmm. you will, where um, we still have a voice. And we need to use our voice, uh, like I said, and uh, we should be supporting those organizations that are skilled in uh, using their voice and and um, and defending uh, biblical Christian values, the biblical Christian yep. faith, right? Um, but at the same time, we shouldn't be fretting and we shouldn't be worrying. We should be continuing 
to do the work of the church that God's called us to. And that's that's how the church advances. So I think I think there's lots of lessons to learn here. And I think that it's it's by learning together um, and speaking about these things that we will learn and continue to move forward as one body. Now I'm going to ask you the question about uh you know, could we be heading into a time where persecution will increase in Canada? Because people will always say to me, yeah, persecution is coming to Canada. And I'd say, well, persecution has already come to Canada. And we can learn, you know, even from history. Uh, and we're going to talk yeah. about your book in a moment. But before uh, we leave the uh, Bill C-367, uh, just want to kind of summarize it for those that may be not familiar but it is an amendment that will repeal the criminal code. That's a section that talks about willfully promotion of hatred. Now, you've already said, and I would agree with this, we're against hatred. And that's where it gets a little bit tricky for society looking at Christians. Well, no, you're promoting hatred by quoting your book. And again, it's we've got to have wisdom, man. <laughs> but the text goes on to say that everyone who by communicating statements other than in a private conversation willfully promotes hatred against any identifiable group is guilty of an indictable offense and is liable to imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years. And then the second part of that is an offense punishable on summary conviction. Now, currently, there are those religious protections. We've talked about it. And uh, the last I heard that uh, this bill has actually been stalled. There's another bill that's being proposed. Uh, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. Uh, but Floyd, what would it happen? What would have to happen before the voice of the martyrs would be more engaged in persecution in Canada? Because again, some people say, no, there's no persecution. And others would say, yeah, persecutors come because of, you know, some of the things that were happening, even with the truckers and, you know, pastors being arrested and the whole COVID thing, which is a real mess, caused a lot of problems in the church. But uh, from your perspective as the CEO of uh, the Voice of the Martyrs, Ministry to the Persecuted Church, uh, when would you see or do you see a point where Voice of the Martyrs could be involved in some of the issues in Canada? Yeah, I, I think so. At least raising awareness. I think. I think you know, even if an, a pastor were arrested today uh, for preaching a sermon that uh, that uh, talks about the you know the um, the sanctity of marriage, as we see in the Bible, that it's between a man and a woman, and he is he is brought up on a on a hate charge and found guilty, and spends two years in prison. Um, I think certainly Voice of Martyrs would be there um, to, um, you know, the, do their family, does his family need care? Uh, we would certainly be advocating for prayer for him, for his family, for his congregation. Um, again, financially, uh, if this were to happen today, you're looking at denominations, you're looking at the church itself, you're looking at individuals that would probably rally around the family. So it would be like any other case, uh, you know, what kind of needs are there? So would we get involved? We would get involved to some degree, obviously. I think so, especially, you know, it clearly uh, shows that it is a case of persecution. Um, but again, still, we have to recognize that you know, there is a, a larger segment in the world that has absolutely no resources. Well, I wouldn't say that. They have resources, um, but but they have limited resources mm -hmm. to be able to respond to these things. And these are the areas where we seek to help. You know, I one of the things I talk about, uh, and you know I'm involved a little bit with uh, church sponsorship and bringing churches together with those that have fled countries. Some of it is legitimate persecution at the voice of the martyrs. We don't get involved in that. And I've told right. people like, Hey, I care about it. Floyd cares about it. Our organization cares about people that are, you know, stuck in Thailand as an example, fleeing Pakistan. But if we were to get involved, uh, you know, as, as one of the, you know, main thing that we did, it would take away from the things that we feel we're called to. And, yeah. I, and I encourage all organizations stick to what God has called you to. Now you yeah. and I have other, uh, involvement in our local churches and other ministries, things that we're involved in away from the voice of the martyrs. But when we're yeah. talking about our work with VOM Canada, it is the persecuted church happening internationally. So we'll continue to watch that Floyd. 
but now I want to talk about your book, uh, which has now been translated into a number of different yeah. languages. It, it won an award. It's a great book. I promote it. I was recently in Halifax and, uh, and talking about the persecution scale, which really piques people's interest because mm -hmm. say, well, you know, again, is there persecution in Canada? And we say, yes, uh, we don't want to make persecution everything, but if we don't say that, you know, some of the things that are happening in areas we're involved in, you know, when people are arrested in in China or Pakistan and, you know, those that are killed in Nigeria supporting their families. I mean, we're we're involved at a, at a stage where it really gets into more of the well, violent or people are arrested right. for their faith, that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean there's not persecution. So trouble on the way. And this is uh, how we describe it on our website. It will not only help readers recognize persecution in all forms, but also enable them to stand firmly against it. The book mm -hmm. does not promote a doormat Christianity, but rather asserts quite the opposite, a victorious, resilient faith that not only survives, but also thrives. And, mm -hmm. and I love the way that you put the book together because you used a number of different stories as one story and showed right. you know clearly the level of persecution. Now, before we talk about the persecution scale, why did you write the book? Why was it important for you to, to get trouble on the way out there? And, and as I mentioned now, it's getting all over the world in various, uh, in, uh, various translations. Yeah, and and I'm surprised about that because I I you know the main purpose of the book was to address, you know, in our context, Canadian Christians, and I guess you could say then Western Christians, but Christians that aren't used to um what they would say being persecuted. Um and so what we would find when we talk to um Christians here in Canada is that they would have a view, they would have questions about persecution, as you said, right? Some would claim that they're being persecuted. And when you looked at their case and what they were trying to say, like, no, that's not persecution. Whereas other people would say, well, there's absolutely no persecution in Canada. So you would have these different extremes. But, you know, the Bible says all who seek to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Yeah. And so, how does that look in our context then? And so that that got me really thinking. And I had a lot of discussions with, you know, our, our former CEO and, and uh, late friend Glenn Penner on these type of issues. And we had a lot of back and forth and, and uh, driving to and from the office and the car together and a lot of discussions. And so a lot of my questions and, and ponderings came out of that time with him, but then really digging into the words like, well, okay, what does this mean that every everyone who seeks to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted? And so that that was the aim of the book is to answer that question, but mainly for a Western audience. And then I find that, you know, um, partners from around the world, when, you know, you give them a copy and like you, you know, when you travel, you, hey, here's a book I wrote and hope you enjoy it and blesses you. And and then you you surprise and you find out, hey, we need this book here. We need our people to read this, right? And so then you find out that God had a bigger purpose for that than than maybe we ever intended, which is really amazing and humbling to to think about. Well, it is. Uh, it's a great book. I you know personally enjoyed it, and uh, I love promoting. In fact, we ran out of copies. <laughs> Uh, in the Maritimes, uh, but I, you know, get people the information on the website. Again, I'm going to put the link uh, on the episode notes here. So let's just briefly go through it then, Floyd. Uh, when we look at the persecution scale, uh, so, you know, it starts out, okay, maybe what we consider minor, and then it, you know, it escalates to violence, you know, and arrests, and and then ultimately, ultimately martyrdom. So mm -hmm. where does it, where do you see persecution uh, beginning? And what do you talk about in the book in terms of the beginning of the persecution scale. Yeah. So before I get into that, let's let's talk a little bit about persecution, and um, because I think I think there's a lot that um, would be, be helpful for anybody that hasn't read the book that is thinking about reading the book, uh, helping them in this. So when we, as a Westerner, when we in Canada typically think about persecution, we think about um, some of the more uh, violent or hurtful forms of persecution. And so then we think that the aim of persecution is to inflict pain because that's what we hear about. We hear about Christians being tortured. We hear about Christians being imprisoned and beaten in prison. We hear about 
um, Christians being martyred. And so we think of persecution only in its 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 violent, um, its bloody form, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. But but that's not the aim of the per of persecution. That really be, is a byproduct of persecution. When we think about the aim of persecution, the aim of persecution is not to inflict pain, but to silence faithful Christian witness. So if we think about the body of Christ, we are a global church made up of different people, different ethnicities, different denominations, but we're all one body. And what are we doing? We are advancing. We are moving. How do we know that we're moving? Well, because we've been commissioned by God to move, right? The Great mm -hmm. Commission. Yep. What does it tell us? Go, right? Go into the world, proclaim the good news, preach the gospel, baptize, teach. That's what we're called to do. So it is a church on mission that is on the move. And it's not just for the missionaries that are going out to some far out places. And it's not just for the pastors who are speaking, you know, and preaching in churches. It's for everybody who considers themselves to be a follower of Christ. So the Bible tells us, go into the world. But we know that when we go into the world, the world is a hostile place. So you picture the children of Israel, one nation leaving Egypt. The Lord took them out of slavery, brought them to a desert, a hostile environment for living where they would have to face the elements, but they would also have to face enemies that would seek to destroy them. Well, to me, when I look at that, that's a picture of the church. We are, here we are in a, in a hostile world, a world that uh, for the most part is opposed to Christ, opposed to the gospel. And what are we called? We're called to go out as, as sheep among wolves, mm -hmm. but advance, right? So then you see this amazing scripture come as, as Jesus, as he's calling us to go, there's this amazing scripture. Uh, and upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's interesting that it's the church that comes against the gates of hell. Mm -hmm. It's not the gates of hell that come against the church because gates don't move. They're stationary. Right? Yes. They're stationary, right? The enemy is not going to attack a group of people that are just not interested in, in advancing or doing anything, right? It's going to... Uh, only be concerned about a group of people that are moving. So the, the, the church comes up against the gates of hell. Now, we've been given armor. We read that in Ephesians 6, right? We've been given the helmet of salvation, breastplate of righteousness, right? We've given the buckle of truth, feet fitted with the gospel of peace, short sword or, or the shield of faith, and the sword of the spirit. So as we advance, we're given this armor. We have a God who is with us, who promises he will be with us. He will never leave us or forsake us. So we have that confidence, right? And then we're given this sword of the spirit. So as we advance against the gates of hell, we use the sword of the spirit, which is truth. And when we plunge it into the side of the enemy, this, this sword of truth, the enemy will react in one of two ways. He will either submit to truth and recognize the truth, right? Which is what we aim, which is what we hope to sure. do. Yeah. Or he will reject the truth. Those that reject the truth, again, it's the church that's advancing. I keep saying this. It's us that's on the advance. Mm -hmm. It's us that's on the offensive. Those that oppose the truth, will take a defensive posture and strike back using persecution. Mm, okay, yeah. But it is it is their defensive means of stopping the advance of the church moving forward. So I think that's very, I think it's very important for us to grasp that because it's not... Now suddenly it's not, oh, we poor Christians were being victimized by a unjust judge or a or a or a 
or a prime minister that hates us or government officials that they, they just want to eliminate Christianity. Like, no, it is a church that's on Vance. We are on the offensive. There's a defensive posture being taken, right? But that should not stop us from moving forward and advancing because the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church. You know, when I heard you teach that one time, Floyd, and uh, in, our, in our staff devotional, and I've been talking about this ever since, I know you and I are both sports fans. We yeah. have our favorite hockey teams, and we have a little bit of fun with that, and it's a good distraction from some of the other and crazy right. things going on in our world. But I like to use that analogy. We're not just hanging on, like, you know, if if you're, they say, you know, good offense produces good defense. You know, you're on right. the offensive, and then you don't have to worry about I mean, you still have to defend, of course, but you know, we're, we're not just hanging on. And I think when right. you bring it into perspective, and I think that's the, the challenge that many Canadian Christians are having. Well, we have rights. Yeah. Right. And we don't expect that things would turn on us where, you know, we've been talking about this, uh, this proposed sure. bill mm -hmm. where we would maybe not have the freedom to speak. And you think about right. China and Pakistan and many nations around the world where there is no freedom except they continue to preach the gospel and they may have to meet in secret, but right. the gospel will not be chained. I think it was the apostle Paul used that in analogy. Um, so the persecution scale then, um, where are we, do you think in a, overall in Canada and, mm -hmm. and where does it start and what, what are some mm -hmm. of the things that are maybe already, cause that's what I, I pulled your book out at this conference I was at and said, I think we're like maybe two or three steps in here. Mm -hmm. um, and again, where VOM gets involved when it, you know, it becomes more, you know, violent and people are arrested, things right. like that. But right. uh, yeah, let's talk about the persecution scale. Yeah. So, so again, when the church is advancing, part of the, part of the thing that, that a church that advances or on the offensive understands is that it anticipates that it will face opposition, right? Mm -hmm. That if you're on the offensive, you know, that you're going to come against the defense, right? And uh, there's going to be some bruises and there's going to be some things that you need to anticipate in order to be successful in your advance. So really, when we look at the persecution scale, we come to the first thing that's called ridicule. And, and some people might stop at that and go, ridicule, really? Like being laughed at? But if you think about the effects of ridicule, that it, it, it when you're talking about persistent, uh, continuous uh, mockery, of something you believe, of something that you value, of something that you not only believe, but deep, believe deep within your core, it's the essence of who you are as a Christian. Um, and that continues to be mocked openly um, in front of people, maybe in front of your peers, if you're at school or at, in the workplace, uh, that can have strong effects and detrimental effects on people to the point that you can lose your will to yeah. publicly state that you're Christian or what you believe, right? And so then you 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 become inward focused and you become isolated and you hold your faith in and you make it private. Well, isn't that what they're all asking the church to do? Don't preach your gospel out in the public square. Keep it private. You can preach it in your churches if you want. Keep it in the walls of your church, right? Don't don't bring it out into the public. That's that's the aim of persecution is to silence Christian voices. And I think that in Canada and especially in Western nations, ridicule has been one of the most effective forms of silencing the church and keeping us uh, uh, of, of, of not being stepping forward boldly in faithful Christian witness. And so I think I think that yeah, ridicule is persecution mm -hmm. because it's 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 achieving the aims of persecution. Again, the byproduct of persecution is the you know the 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 violence that you may see, right? The effects. But the goal and the aim of persecution is to silence the church. Once you move out of ridicule, you move into more forms of harassment where things become a little more intense, uh, where, where you're being harassed on a number of fronts, maybe not just being laughed at, but suddenly your family could be facing uh, ridicule. Um, you're, you're finding pressure from, from your peers. 
Um, and and just because of of something something you believe and something that that you want others to uh, to witness. And again, we're talking about active witness people that are actively living out their faith in public. So from harassment, you can you can easily move then from discrimination and defamation. Defamation um, is it's it's not only about a, a ruining your name and your reputation. But it affects you deeply that once once a lie is said about you, right? Um, how do you how do you stand up in public, right? Knowing that here you are speaking or you're you're presenting this gospel, and you know that you're speaking to people that have heard about these these you know these these lies about you, these things that are not true. Do you sit there and take your time and just gonna well I'm just gonna defend myself? I'm gonna prove myself right. Or do you just take the sword of the spirit and go, this is what I have to fight with, right? I'm going to pray. I'm going to take 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 the word. And I'm going to speak into this situation and speak the word of life to people and let my witness be a testimony uh, for others. Um, so I think I think in Canada, to answer your question, certainly ridicule. I think I think a lot of Christians have experienced ridicule because of their faith. Mm -hmm. Maybe levels of harassment in their workforce or in their school, right? Hey, if you don't get online, that I'm not, you're not going to get that grade that you deserve, or you're not going to get that promotion that maybe you're aiming for. Uh, certain pressures that way that that you know harass you to to kind of get you online with with the way other people are thinking. Uh, discrimination. Defamation, defamation, definitely. You see that happening already uh, in the media. Um, you know the the term evangel evangelical <laughs> in Canada means something a whole lot different to you and I mm -hmm. than to the average Joe picking up the newspaper, right? Um, we're, we're defamed in some way uh, from that, which which then leads to discrimination, right? Like, well, if these guys are not really Canadian, like then why are they having the same rights that that we have you know those type of things and so you can easily see that spiraling down pretty quickly and then that's not a, you know once that happens that's just a short jump to you know as we talked about certain people being imprisoned uh for their faith or for their christian activities um charities christian charities uh maybe losing uh certain rights when it comes to uh tax tax benefits and and uh, issuing tax losing your charitable status all these things can start to happen fairly quickly after that and one of the things i uh, you know as you're talking about uh, you know the, some of the harassment things like that we have to operate with wisdom and there's time there's times that you know i live in alberta and uh, you know there's pastors that are very provocative uh they're mm -hmm. very aggressive and, you know, you're not going to tell me what to do to the authorities. So trying to uh, respect authorities and then yet, you know, preaching the gospel, but, you know, not mm -hmm. doing it in a way that's, you know, offensive to other people. I mean, let, you know, the message of Jesus, to get that out there. And I mean, I was speaking at my church recently where I attend here in, in Alberta and just saying, you know, if people are going to persecute me, and harass me or whatever. I want it to be for the gospel, not for being annoying. And and we've mm -hmm. even traveled, Floyd, to countries where some of our brothers and sisters, because of the loudness of their, you know, their worship service in an area where people may be trying to sleep on a Sunday morning, uh, you know, so we'd have to make sure that, you know, when we are suffering, it's because it's the gospel, not because right. of our actions. And, you know, we're all humans and we can learn from each other. I mean, I've learned that there's some things that are, uh, you know, worth fighting for that, as like my wife would say, you know, that uh, that's the hill to die on, but not yeah. that hill. And so right. we have to have that wisdom and and we can really learn from our brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and uh, you know, as, as Glenn used to say too, and, and, you know, as a good reminder all the time, is it perfect, you know, persecuted Christians are not perfect. Uh, right. They are just like us. They're human. They make mistakes. And, sure. you know, they're just trying to be faithful to the gospel. So if folks want to get more information, again, I would encourage you to get Trouble on the Way. It's a great book. I'm going to put the, the link on there. I'm also going to put the link, as I mentioned, to the interview 
that uh, Jeff King did with the Christian Broadcasting Network, uh, you know, to hear more about that. And you can learn, uh, you know, more about the bill. There's uh, lots of information uh, on the internet. So Floyd, before we close, uh, the thing I was going to do in this podcast, because it's something that we hold probably as our strongest value is to pray. Mm -hmm. And it's in praying that we know God works. We pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. That's why we have what's called the persecution and prayer alert. Again, I'll put another link on there um, because we need to be praying for our brothers and sisters. It's a part of how we, you know, share in the fellowship of those that are going through these difficult times. But yeah, can you just pray Floyd? And um, I mean, want to pray for, you know, what's going on in in our country and uh, whatever the Lord has on your heart. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your presence with us, God. We thank you, Lord, that you have told us that you will never leave us or forsake us, uh, that you are with us. You tell us that we do not need to be afraid, that we do not need to be afraid of those that will come against us, Father, uh, that we um, can keep our eyes on you and that, um, that you are a God who is in control, Father, that you care for us. You care for us, uh, from the smallest degree to the largest degree, and that we can cast our cares upon you. And so God, as we, as Christians here in Canada, as we seek to be your hands and feet, uh, to be your voice, to shine your light, to speak your truth, God, I pray that you would give us wisdom, that we would not shrink away from truth, but speak truth uh, in love and respect, for our neighbors, Father. Um, I pray that we would be bold in our witness, uh, Father, even even in areas that are hostile, Father, that we would be bold and that we would continue to proclaim your name, Father. And I pray that we would also be able to live it out, that we would live out this faith that we profess, God, that um, people would be drawn to us because we live differently. We speak differently. We look differently. We talk differently. Mm -hmm. God, I pray that as a church, Father, we would be uh, true examples of what it means to be one that has been saved, one that has been redeemed, one that has been forgiven, set free, and Father, now following you and doing the work that you've called us to do, going into the world and proclaiming the good news. Mm-hmm. God, we we know that in Canada, um, we do not face some of the persecution that other brothers and sisters around the world do. Father, we know that there are some that are in prison right now. We know that there are some that have lost husbands or fathers or mothers. Uh, we know that there are some that have watched their homes being burnt down or the churches demolished, Father. We know that There are some that um, have lost their income, Father, that have lost maybe their crops have been burned or taken from away from them, Father. Father, so much persecution. We know that there are some that have been beaten, Father. There are many Christians who are walking around with prosthetics because they've had limbs cut off. Mm -hmm. Father, we think of those. And we pray, Father, that we know that you see them all. And we pray, Lord, that they would rejoice in the midst of their suffering because their joy is not built on the circumstances that they face. The joy is built in the hope that as believers we have in you, that you will one day call us home, that you will one day bring us this rich reward where we will be with you. And God, I pray that this hope would not diminish within our persecuted brothers and sisters. I pray that this hope would be fueled. So for every orphan, for every widow, for every prisoner, Father, for every um, patient, Father, for everyone that's been beaten, Father, we pray right now that they would sense your presence with them. And Father, that they would be encouraged, they would be strengthened. And Father, that they would continue to live for you. I pray that you would provide for their physical needs, Father, for their food, for their income, for their families, Father. You would be their provision. You would be their source, God. And we just pray, Father, uh, a blessing over them in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Father, that we have the opportunity to do this work and to serve them, uh, Father, as best that we can, as you've called us to. 
So we thank you for them, Father. We thank you for the vital part that they are within the body of Christ. And may we in Canada learn from them and learn from their example, Father, that we too may follow Christ with an abandon that just lays it all for him because it, it is he is worth everything uh, that we have, God. And so the very breath itself, Father, Jesus is worth it all. Yeah. And so give us that boldness, we pray. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you so much, Floyd. Floyd Brabell, yeah. the Chief Executive Officer of the Voice of the Martyrs Canada. And if you'd like to find out more about uh, the ministry of the Voice of the Martyrs Canada, go to vomcanada.com. And if I could also ask you, you know, if you're watching, listening, to write a review, rate this podcast, share it with a friend, the more people that hear about it, uh, the higher we get on, you know, in terms of the people looking for podcasts. Uh, so again, it's just not about having many, many people listening and watching. Certainly that's important. But the most important thing is that more people engaged with the persecuted church. They pray and uh, th that's what we want. And again, as I said before, when we've traveled, uh, you know, come back to Canada and you say to our brothers and sisters, what do you want us to do? What do you, what's the most important thing? Say, can you please tell our Canadian brothers and sisters to pray? And mm -hmm. it's in the praying that, you know, we're activated uh, by the Holy Spirit. And uh, so it's an incredible privilege, as you talked about in your, or as you were praying, Floyd, it's an incredible privilege to serve our brothers and sisters in this yeah, way. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks, Greg. And remember, the closer you are to Jesus, the closer you are to the fire.